Good morning, everyone. Our call to worship this morning is from the letter of Paul to Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 14, and that begins on page 1077 of the Church Bible. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. <clears throat> Dear Jesus, we thank you and sometimes feel unworthy for the sacrifice you made on our behalf, the ultimate sacrifice. You gave your life so that we may have eternal life and all we need to do is believe in you. We all here do believe in you and we pray for continued grace and strength and growth in our faith so that we may please you and our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That was a great scripture and a great prayer, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Lord bless you folks for being here this hour, this day. A uh, beautiful day that he has made. Uh, please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Uh, greatly uh, appreciate that. Um, sorry, Noreen. You're forgiven. Uh, special welcome to Rick, uh, Paula's husband. Good morning, Rick. Great to see you. Uh, anyway, uh, and uh, Dave and Dorothy, great to see you folks as well. Good morning. Uh, Matt and Martha, great to see you too. Uh, very quickly here, folks, uh, so we uh, are in the book of James on Wednesday night. Uh, we did an overview, and we're going to be uh, uh, taking that book apart uh, Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We encourage you to that time uh, uh, if you have the schedule. Uh, also, uh, discipleship class will not meet until November 12th. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of which, on November 12th, I have Stephen King coming from the Massachusetts Family Institute. Uh, that is a Christian organization that was years ago started under focus on the family, but they separated out for, uh, I guess, um, some sort of uh, legal reasons. But Massachusetts um, Family Institute is on the front lines of uh, fighting for religious liberties uh, for, for believers. Uh, Carol, uh, Carol Shirtliff's husband, Mike, uh, a distant cousin, I think it was Hal Shirtliff, um, took the state uh, to the, uh, to the to, uh, up to the state Supreme Court and won a case, but Massachusetts Family Institute supported that process. And I get text uh, uh, multiple times through the week about the, the, the work that they're doing legally as we have a, a government that becomes more encroaching uh, on uh, all sorts of rights, especially uh, Christian rights, religious rights. So we're going to have Michael King here, and I encourage you uh, to uh, that time. Uh, but November 12th, um, the discipleship will not uh, happen until that, until that date. Uh, also, this coming Saturday, we, um, my goodness, it's uh, like right here, uh, Harvest Supper, uh, 5.30 at the church. Uh, we need your help to prepare food on Friday evening. Now, Liz, I don't know if I should turn this over to you at this particular. Well, I'm trying to move it to Friday afternoon. Friday think. afternoon, okay. At three, if that's possible. I just didn't know whether I could be here at that time. I think I can be. So. Okay, so you're trying to be here Friday at three, yeah. okay? And I will text people that have approached me and let them okay. know. Okay, and uh, what can you give us a sense of what you need to get done so we, how many people you might Chop, need? Chopping and peeling. Chopping and peeling. Potatoes, Potatoes, carrots, squash, squash, onions, onions, celery, celery. That's about yeah. Okay, all right. 
Now look, guys are saying like, I'm all thumbs in the kitchen. Come on, uh, guys can do it. I've bring done it. Bring your own peeler too. What's that? Bring your own peeler if you have a. Oh, bring your own peeler, okay. We have some, but people say they don't like them. Okay, all right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have my favorite one at home too. Okay, all right, so um, Friday at three o'clock and um, also, uh, so we want to encourage you to invite somebody who is unchurched or who is not currently going to a church. And um, we, um, um, uh, we pray that God will give you the opportunity to do that. Also, there is a sign-up sheet, and it, Liz, I don't know, I haven't looked at it, have you looked at it? But there's a sign-up sheet in terms of what um, you, you might possibly be bringing, right? And are you all set for turkeys? And I don't know. I was waiting for the end of church today because usually okay. it's last night. All right. Well, there's a sign-up sheet, and uh, if you're able to make it and you're able to bring something, that would be awesome. And hopefully we can um, um, see you th uh, Friday at, at, at 3 o'clock. Okay. Um, I don't think I have anything else to share. Anything else for the – yeah, Jane and then Jackie. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your participation, and we'll figure out the totals later. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Right, thank you very right. much. Yeah. Thank you for your giving. Yep. And Jackie. The service forms that do today, uh, you, if you decide what committee or what uh, office you'd like to put up hold, because Jerry and I are going to meet this week and hide to, um, you know, flesh out the forms and see who's where we need extra people. So. If you have, if you uh, have your form, you can give it to one of us, Heidi or I, today, or you know, we'll be in touch with you during the <coughs> tracking down. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Jackie. Yep. Anything else then? Nothing else. Okay. Uh, we're going to sing our next song. Um, Bob, welcome back, Bob. We missed you last week.
Our tithes and offering verse this morning is the first verse of the 24th Psalm. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Heavenly Father, bless our gifts into your ministry, into this good ground. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so before we lead in a word of prayer, and I'd like to open it up to the congregation, uh, do you have any prayer requests that you or someone you would like to pray for today? Anything on your? Yeah, Joshua yeah. saw the surgeon this past week, and they're planning the repair surgery which for the traumatic cataract. Um, in February, but he told her, she told him that if there was too much damage, she would be able to really fix it in one surgery. So I guess my prayer would be that the Lord continue to heal that eye. Okay. So there's not multiple surgeries. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Okay, very good. I appreciate that. Yeah. As you know, Josh, uh, uh, Josh had an eye accident, what, about two, two, two well, and a half months ago, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's not forget Keith Johnson uh, had his little toe amputated. He's in Morton, and uh, not sure if he's going to a rehab. Um, it's kind of still waiting for that. And then, of course, uh, Edie, Jerry, uh, Mickey, and Dave. Uh, and Dave has his uh, surgery, his major surgery, at the end of the month. So um, just pray for physical strength and spiritual um, and emotional strength for, for that time. Yes, uh, Paula. Hi. Okay, very good. Uh, Luke has, um, is it um, um, autism? Autism, thank you. I couldn't, I was right on the tip of my tongue. Thank you. Okay, very good. Anybody else? Israel. Israel, absolutely. Pray for Israel. It's a tough time, real tough time. It's going to get tougher too. Who knows when, but. Uh, be strong and courageous because it's going to get tougher. Hey, Annie, did you have something else? No, God knows. God knows. Absolutely, God knows. Absolutely. And he cares. God knows and he cares. So, um, 
I prayed in the prayer closet. Uh, the Lord captured my heart years ago. I know he's captured your heart. That's why you're here. And he's a great, great God. Uh, he's so forgiving and so loving. And he's shepherded you, if you think about it, in a very, very wonderful way. Uh, so I encourage you, praise you, feel led, and I'll close our time. Amen. I pray for wisdom and counsel for the leaders of this nation and our president that you mm -hmm. would guide them all the mm -hmm. along the path what they should do and what their responses should be. Lord, have mercy on us. Mm -hmm. Father God, I pray for the victims and survivors of the shooting to the main and that you be with them, comfort them, heal them, Amen. Father, I thank you for this time that we have to collectively, as one body, come together to magnify your name, mm -hmm. to worship you. I thank you for always being faithful to us. Mm -hmm. May we always come humbly before you, Father, with our burdens mm -hmm. and with our praises. Mm -hmm. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your presence. And we pray that your presence would be a great comfort, a great source of comfort and hope to our hearts. Uh, we pray for uh, the peace uh, to be upon our hearts, Lord, that passes all understanding, that you might give us wisdom uh, discernment, understanding, uh, patience, grace, 
uh, mercy in every situation that we uh, might be like you in every way uh, as uh, sons and daughters of the living God. Uh, thank you for the prayers that have been lifted up for Israel in this place. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, your hand of protection would be uh, upon the planning, the operations, uh, the decisions that are made. I also, Heavenly Father, pray that some of the, the Palestinians that are being held against their will and being used as human shields would find a way of escape, uh, that you would create conditions uh, whereby uh, they might be able to escape. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, you protect uh, your people and you have a special place. Uh, uh, Israel's the apple of your eye and you have a special place for them. Uh, and uh, we know that you're gonna return, uh, you're, you're her defender and you're gonna return in a mighty, mighty way. Um, but we ask for your blessing uh, upon the nation right now. We thank you for the unity um, that is uh, in, in the country and what they have to do. Um, Father, also, um, Thank you uh, that you constantly live to make intercession for us, Lord, uh, before your throne of grace. And thank you for the ministry of intercession. Uh, thank you that we can lift up Keith. Um, thank you um, for his uh, spirit, uh, enduring spirit, persevering spirit with all the issues that he has going on uh, at such a young age. Um, we pray that you would touch him and um, bring healing to him. Um, also, Lord, we pray that you would create a, a situation and environment for him to be able to get his uh, kidney transplants. Um, Father, um, we don't forget Sam Johnson this morning with the many needs, and I pray you would visit Sam and that your will would be done there. Uh, lift up Dave and, and, uh, and set his uh, heart uh, so strong in you for the surgery. Uh, at the end of November. Um, thank you for the tremendous progress that Edie uh, Jackson is making, uh, m nothing short of miraculous and an answer to prayer. And uh, Father, thank you uh, for Mickey. And uh, may uh, he sense your presence and give him great, great joy of heart. Uh, I lift up little Luke, Lord, uh, and we pray that you um, would use the school environment and the teachers uh, that he might be able to grasp and learn. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, capture that little guy's heart uh, early on and that he would be a great man of God for you. Um, we, uh, we thank you that uh, in weakness you're made strong. And I, I, I pray, lift up Luke before your throne of grace. I also, Father, pray for Joshua. Uh, thank you for what you're doing in Joshua's life and heart. Um, and I know that there's a lot of um, um, tumult now and turmoil. Um, but you're overall and in all and through all. And uh, we know that you're at work in Joshua's heart. We pray that um, he would not have to have multiple surgeries. Uh, guide the hands of the doctors and give insight and wisdom. <laughs> Uh, when that uh, surgery is uh, performed. And uh, Father, last but not least, we have a lot of things on our hearts today, a lot of concerns, uh, and maybe just even uh, uh, where we're feeling burdened with failure, uh, we're, we're burdened with uh, just discouragement, um, depression, um, or just losing heart. Uh, because of health problems or family problems. And we, we pray that you would give each and every one of us vision and uh, discernment uh, and allow us to see your hand at work. Um, you're, you're an amazing God. You always accept us uh, when we come humbly and when we come before you with a repentant spirit. And uh, you just love to have us come home and love to have us approach you. And uh, we, we, we pray this, Gail prayed that we would do that uh, humbly, sincerely, uh, with a broken and contrite heart, and um, that we, we would just uh, be amazed in your presence of how, how 
good and great and majestic and loving and merciful you are. And we thank you that we can share this time with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we have another scripture reading, Bill. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 6, and that's found on page 1087 of the Church Bible. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God, testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. God, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. This is the word of our Lord. Oh, I love that scripture. Yeah, even though Abel was dead, he still speaks. That's fantastic. Uh, okay, so last week we had technical difficulty, and so we did this uh, next song.
Our second scripture reading this morning is from the letter of James, the first chapter, verses 1 through 8, and that's found on page 1091 of the Church Bible. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This too is the word of our Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, give you this time and may you uh, speak through, through me uh, what you've laid upon my heart and uh, give life uh, to these words. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the doctor said to the patient, I have some bad news and worse news. It's not good news and bad news, it's bad news and worse news. And uh, so the patient says, let's have it, doc. So the doctor said, the bad news is that you only have 24 hours to live. The patient, being the eternal optimist, said, well, I can't imagine anything worse than that, doctor. The doctor said, well, I forgot to tell you yesterday. <laughs> I hope you never get that kind of response from a doctor. The last couple of weeks, uh, we've looked at perseverance in trials. We've looked at joy in trials. This morning, I want to talk to you about faith in trials. Now, joy and perseverance and faith, it all comes from God because he's the object of our faith. Uh, and yet, we talk about faith, and the scriptures talk about faith because faith is an aspect of the Christian life. Um, it's a gift. We'll look at that a little bit later. It's a gift. But, uh, and every, we looked at it uh, in Romans uh, 12 this morning. Everybody has a measure of faith if you are saved. So faith is a relevant issue in trials. Uh, now, the sermon of the title is Faith in Trials, but it's actually really, this passage is really about faith on trial. And in a trial, uh, one's faith is being put to the test. Uh, the word for testing actually means to be approved and to be tried. And so when God sends a trial into our life and our heart, it's with the goal that we're approved, that we're tried. It, it actually implies a sense of trustworthiness, right? I mean, you, you go to school and you test, right? And, and, it, and it, there's a sense of trustworthiness as you take that test that you manage the material, that you've grasped the material, right? Uh, the, the sense here then in, in, in the scriptures is that faith is tested and tried to see if it is trustworthy, to, to actually see if it is genuine. And that's why various trials and testings are sent our way to determine this. Now, if you think about it, the Lord Jesus Christ, tremendous trial and test, and he was approved uh, through it all. He passed the test. Now, what about the trial itself? Because it's various trials that, that we encounter. What is the origin or the purpose of a trial? Uh, Lord knows, I, I don't know. I mean, some of the trials I've gone through, 
I have no clue. But there was always a, a purpose and there was an origin from that. And, and it's, it's the old adage, only God knows, right? Uh, the Greek word for trial here can uh, also be interpreted temptation. It's the same word. And so when a trial is sent, when God is the agent, it's for the purpose of testing and proving someone in the faith. It's never, ever, ever where God tries to trip us up. There's no darkness in him. There's no evil in him. Uh, we see uh, this with the person of Job. You know, uh, the devil comes before the sons of God, that is the angels, and God said, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him in all the earth. He's a righteous man, upright in the faith. And so the trial was, a, was sent, allowed by God, and was sent Job's way. But when you further take a look at it, it was the devil who sought to tempt Job to get him to sin. Because that's what he was all about, trying to get Job to fall. And so you have trials and temptations, and sometimes they kind of merge and they become one and the same. But it's not where God ever sends it to hurt us or to trip us up. And so re regarding Job, um, his faith and ultimately his character was on trial. And that's how we understand this. Right. Behind this idea of testing and proving one's faith in a time of trial, the, the word, the root word for trial and temptation actually goes back to pierce. It means to pierce something. And the sense here is almost to try to test or attempt to perforate or to pierce. Now, God never sends it to perforate or to pierce. Uh, but God knows the pressure points, doesn't he, to get the proper results. And so James here is speaking to a situation of adversity and affliction, something that is going after our faith, trying or testing our faith, and something that attempts to perforate or pierce our faith. And that's what the devil's all about, to get a foothold, right? So when something is sent by God, there's always a purpose in the trial. And I believe that if we're patient enough, and if we're looking and we're listening and we're, and we're watching and we're waiting... God oftentimes will reveal that to us. It may not be when we're going through it. Oftentimes it might be a month, two months, six months later. It's like, oh, that's, that's why that happened. You see? Maybe, maybe we never are told the purpose of it. And maybe there's good reason for that too. Uh, someone said when God brings men and women into deep waters, he does it uh, not to drown them, but to cleanse them. It's a great quote. Great, great quote. And so a genuine faith here on our part as believers when we go through testing is we, we know that God is good. The scripture says it. We know that God is for us. The scripture tells us that. We know that he's not out to hurt us or to seek harm for us. We know that. And he gives good gifts to his children. Matthew 7. We know that. And we also know too that he's definitely about wanting to refine us. Uh, we looked at the scripture this morning in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. He's about conforming us to the image of his son and transforming us, right, from all this garbage that's in the world. That's a wonderful, wonderful God and wonder, wonderful thing he's doing, right? Job said in chapter 28, verse 1, surely there is a mine for silver and a place where they refine gold. Now, I believe Job was talking about earthly minds, but when God sends trials our way, because he's mining the heart, and he's about refining the heart. And, and you know, we have to see all these things as good, and we, can, uh, uh, we hope uh, that we find joy and we praise God in the midst of trials. Now, the reality here is this, is unfortunately not everyone ultimately believes this to be the case. They, they, they just have 
no sense of what God's about and how good he is and how loving and how kind. I have no sense. Uh, I had someone tell me years ago, that's what he said, the closer I get to God, the more I get hurt. I don't want to go close to God. They came marginally close to God before they passed away. Still kept their distance. I've had others tell me they find it hard to trust in God. It's like, I don't know why, I and mean, he's been nothing but good and wonderful Savior to me and to many, many others uh, that come to him. But in each of these cases, there obviously was a real struggle with faith to accept the word of God at faith's value. You know, we, we talk about faith on trial, but, you know, uh, the word of God has been on trial in our culture because they want to throw it out and they want to disbelieve it and they, want to, they suggest that, oh, it's not right or it's wrong or that it's all messed up and you've got all different weird interpretations. Boy, little do they know. You know, we're talking about the word of God that stands forever. Why is it that when we hear the word of God, we cannot trust that what God says is true? You know, uh, the psalmist says his testimony has gone out through all the ends of the earth. And yet people struggle with faith. I don't know why. I don't know why. Anyone who believes to God uh, and comes to God must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Uh, there are two things that I want to say to the struggle regarding faith. It, it, it's, it's called the Genesis crisis. Ever since the fall, you know, you, you see people struggle with what God said. Now, you see it with Eve in the garden, right? Now, she had a little help. She was tempted by the devil. Um, and, you know, the rest is history. But she brought, she bought into the lie that the word of God is not true. That, that God was just telling her something that wasn't really true and um, really had no ground or basis or standing. And she, she takes it hook, line, and sinker, and uh, we, we know the rest of the story. The devil got in there. She questioned God whether he was on the up and up. And that goes right to the heart of the integrity of God. When, when you question God, you question his integrity. I was reading a devotional yesterday, and it was entitled a Satan's Strategic Plan, and it talked about doubting the word of God, and when we doubt, it moves to denial of the word of God, and when we deny, it moves to the denigration of God, and it questions his character and his integrity. And that, that, that must, uh, have you ever had somebody question your integrity? Oh, I, I, I'm telling you, when somebody calls me a liar, I'm, I go from, from zero to 150 in a nanosecond. Because it, it questions my integrity and my character. I can't imagine how God feels when people just kind of dismiss him and his character. It's, it's an awful, awful thing. Also, to address uh, the issue of doubting, let me ask you a question. What is faith after all? We, we know it's a divine gift. We talked about that a little bit earlier, right? It's something that God, you're here today because God has given you the, a divine gift to believe in his only begotten son. That's a precious, precious gift. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not that of yourselves, it is a gift of God. No one should boast, right? So faith is God-given and has a purpose. But how would you define it? Or better, better yet, how does scripture define faith? If you turn over, or turn actually back to Hebrews 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, this is about the closest that you can get. I'm going to attempt to explain what I believe faith is. This is about uh, the closest you will ever get to a definition. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The way I understand faith is that it's, it's a God-given gift and it acts like a spiritual vehicle to help you and me lay hold of something. 
Just like my hand can lay hold of a bottle of water, it helps me to reach out and take hold of it. And it's intended to draw us closer to God. And that's where that person that told me, you know, every time I get close to him, I get hurt. Boy, was he wrong. It's intended to draw us closer. And faith is intended to increase our vision of God. You know, um, Brett yesterday asked me what my sermon was on, and I started to tell him, but think about it. You know, when you're, when you're so far away from something, it looks very, very small. But when you get closer up, it looks very, very big, right? I remember when I was a kid, we were uh, visiting the Grand Canyon, and we were, you know, we were kind of following a, a tour bus, and we got, we got a great tour, even though we didn't pay for it. But the, the guy said, you see that little great wall down there in the canyon? And it looks so, so small. He said it was 1,500 feet high, like the, 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 the height of the Empire State Building. And so when we're further away from God, he looks so, so small. And yet when we get closer and closer and closer, he's magnified, right? And so it, faith is, is intended to take us closer, increase our vision, help us to see the person of God and the hand of God in our circumstances, our trials, and our situations. And it's intended to move us to trust in him in spite of the difficulties. In spite of the difficulties. Now, I, I want to consider Abraham for a moment. Take a look at verse 10 of chapter 11. Because it says that he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. It, and this... This is not about physical sight, but it was about his faith and what he could see. And, and, and so uh, he looked for these things. And, and so faith, if you will, has eyes. It has the ability to spiritually see into the other world, so to speak, of what is, is to come. God gives us glimpses of that in Holy Scripture, too. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's impossible if, 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 uh, to please God. If we don't have faith, then how do we please him? And, and so the, this whole notion of faith on trial, it, it has a divine purpose of sorts. But this, this is my personal experience and, I, and my observations. It separates the sheep and the goats. After a while, you actually see who is in it with the long term with God and who is not? It separates. And it, a faith also, uh, a trial also measures the extent of one's faith. You know, we talk about the faith of a mustard seed, a real little small seed, or how much more? How do you measure that, right? And it also reveals the depth of one's relationship with God. You know, when the going gets tough, the true believer stands in there with great, great grace and strength and hope and perseverance and resolve, and they're resolute in that trial. And they don't move. They're like the rock of Gibraltar. Why? Because of their faith, you see? And so, so, so faith, you know, can be measured, but how much does one really trust God? And you actually see people, sadly, they fall away and they walk away because trem tremendous trials in their life. And they become disillusioned. And they say, you know, well, uh, like I never expected that God would send me that. I've seen it. I've seen it. And it's, it's tragic and it's sad. Earlier I had mentioned that Christ was approved through trials and, and testing. From the earliest time that I ever studied this passage in James, I always saw the Lord Jesus Christ shadow this passage. And, and, and I, I could not... These, these verses here actually evoke Christ's spiritual journey to the cross. And you might say, well, Pastor, how in, in which way? Because um, he's actually talking to believers. Yeah, but Christ is our model, right? Now... Uh, we looked at this scripture last week, Hebrews 12, too. Um, it says about Jesus, who, for the joy set before him, he had joy in his trial. 
He knew everything that he was doing as he went to the cross. He had, we, don't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't say that he had saving faith in his trial, because God's the Savior, right? But he certainly most trusted his Heavenly Father every step to the cross. And all the three years that he ministered and all the 33 years he lived on planet Earth. In every single detail, in every tribulation, in every trial, he's like this with God the Father. He trusted that everything he did was of God and in God. We talk about perseverance. The Lord Jesus Christ had great, great perseverance. The scripture says he set his face toward Jerusalem. Now, I, I want you to capture that, folks. You know, we say, oh, well, Jesus, you know, he died. You know, sometimes we don't appreciate what he had to go through. We say, oh, we, you know, he died at Calvary, walked Calvary's road. Can you imagine the heartache, the heartbreak, the trial, the tribulation, the perseverance to set your face? And you take a look at Gethsemane. You take a, the passage in Gethsemane where he, you know, he, capillaries break and he, and, he, and he sweats drops of blood. That was tremendously hard for him, folks. Tremendously hard. He endured the cross, persevering, persevered all the way to it. And, and you know, I, I, why is it when people go through trials, why is it that they rarely never, rarely to never consider the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and his goodness, always goodness and always innocence, always righteousness and his end of life, and they don't consider that. I mean, he didn't deserve what he got. Uh, in the words of the, uh, one of the thieves, uh, we are suffering justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. And so why is it when we get a trial, you know, like uh, we don't think of the Lord Jesus and what he went through? Uh, he's a great, great example for dealing with stuff. And, and so James is teaching that good things actually come out of uh, darkness and come out of trials. You take the darkest day in history, Christ dying at Calvary, and what, what comes out of that? A resurrected life and the destruction of death. And, and I say, I can't wait till he rolls it all up. Amen? Uh, I, I love what somebody wrote uh, about what comes out of darkness. Out of the darkness, out of the dark forbidding soil, pure white lilies grow. Out of the black and murky clouds descends the stainless snow. Out of the crawling earthbound worm, a butterfly is born. Out of the somber shrouded night, behold, a golden morn. Out of the pain and stress of life, the peace of God pours down. Out of the nails, the spear of the cross, redemption and a crown. There's a lot of goodness that comes out of darkness. Now, we don't run to the darkness with, with the hope that good comes out of it, right? But God uses it in that way. And so trials and tests are part of the spiritual journey. And uh, faith on trial gets to the heart and the substance of what one really believes about the Almighty. And I believe that trials and tribulations are intended intended to allow us to see what God wants to do in our life and heart. And, you know, I believe that he allows us to see his hand at work from time to time. And, 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 and that's comforting because I know that God is at work. So it's a spiritual transport to a vehicle to take hold of the heavenly things, and if you will, to bring us into the throne room of God and to allow him to see what he's doing. It also shows us ultimately what's in our hearts, does it not? How we respond, how we react, whether we walk away or we come back for more. What did, what did Jesus say? I, I'm sorry, Peter say to Jesus, Lord, you, you have the words of eternal life. Where, where am I going to go? Where are we going to go? <laughs> right? Um, very quickly here, um, James chapter 1, verse 1, James chapter 2, verse 1. James make it, makes it very, very clear that God is to be the object of our faith. We don't want to focus on faith. 
We want to focus on God, who is the object of our faith. And when we do that, I believe our spiritual vision will grow. Uh, one, one final thought. Um, I see trials and tribulations as kind of like spiritual acupuncture. Uh, anybody ever been to an acupuncture person? Okay. It, it works sometimes, right? It works, right? I don't know how it works, but it works. God knows perfectly and completely where he's going to send that trial and the pressure points. He knows it. And he sends those things our way to get us moving in the right direction in which he wants to go. So he pierces in the right way the right pressure points to bring about the proper result. Uh, in the words of St. Paul, Romans 5, uh, we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character. So in closing, uh, God's the great physician. We're the patient. Uh, the trials uh, are never bad news and worse news. They're always good news because they approve our faith. And I think that that is the moral of the story. If you are going through a trial, um, and I know that some of you uh, have or are, and, um, and, and if we're not, then we will be. And, and I hope that this gives you uh, great, great spiritual food uh, for thought and uh, fuel to your soul. Uh, let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for what you send our way, uh, the trials, uh, the tribulations. Uh, and we thank you that it's never um, to hurt us or to trip us up, but to uh, refine us and uh, try us and prove us in the faith. Um, we thank you that you've given, uh, given us everything for life and godliness. And we thank you that you uh, are able to find a way of escape for us uh, when we're under great, great temptation and um, when, when the devil seeks to, to, to trip us up or cause us to fall or to fail. Uh, you're always there uh, to lift us up and to raise us to higher ground. I, I thank you for the blessed people, um, your people that I see uh, before me this morning, Lord. I pray that you would encourage their heart, uh, fill their hearts, um, comfort their hearts, and, and stir the hope uh, and renew them uh, spiritually in, in your great, great promises. And we want to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, folks, our closing hymn is number 528. My faith has found a resting place. 528. Please stand. <clears throat>